Thank you so much. Would you uh, thank you? Thank you. Today we're talking about Catholics have a bigger Bible, and they have a lot of things actually. And so uh, we're going to be talking specifically tonight about the Apocrypha, the Saints, and the Blessed Virgin. And so before we started, I just kind of wanted to let you know where I'm coming from, just so that you can. We'll just make it all clear from the get-go, right? First thing is I'm obviously coming from a Protestant perspective. Right, I'm in a Methodist church. I grew up in the Methodist church. Now, for a brief period, I'm going to just be transparent here. For a brief period, for like four years, I did, I did venture over into the Episcopal church. I know, it's hard to imagine. Um, but I saw why. <laughs> no, uh, but I, you know, there was a while where I was a part of the Anglican communion. Uh, but now... I am here in the Methodist Church, I'm coming from a Protestant perspective, and, the, and just really to lay it all in and be very clear, I believe that Catholics are Christians, which I think is weird that I have to say that. I think it's weird that I have to say that, because for a very, very long time, there wasn't anything besides Catholicism, right? If you were a Christian, you were a Catholic. It really wasn't until people started getting um, really upset with each other and breaking off from the Catholic Church that we had anything besides Catholicism. And so it's always, in the way I see it, if anything, the people that have to justify whether or not they're Christians are the people who broke away, right? But, just to lay it out there, I believe that Catholics are Christians, which is important because if not, we have a real serious problem. In the world, uh, amongst all those claiming to be Christians, 50% of the world, 50% of the Christians in the world are Catholics. And if you add into that the Orthodox, which if you and I walked into an Orthodox church or a Catholic church, we probably wouldn't know the difference. And so if you add in the Orthodox church, it's 60% of uh, the world's Christians are in one of those areas, which means we would have a real problem if over half of the people who claim to be Christians were not Christians, right? So, that's where we're starting, and we're going to kind of build off of that foundation. And, and I think a lot of the places where you might say, I don't know if this counts as Christianity. I think we're going to come to a better understanding where we can, we can all kind of be on the same page by the end. But let's start with the Apocrypha. Uh, the Apocrypha is books in the Old Testament. There's a selection of books in the Old Testament that are not in the Old Testament uh, for the Protestant Church. So just to give you an idea, um, this is my falling apart Bible. So you know, I'm just going to take that part out. What? It's not an important part. Um, <laughs> uh, so this is the Bible, right? All together, that's that. And then, the Apocrypha is this much, right? This has the Apocrypha in it, so it's this much of the Bible. It's not nothing, but it's definitely not a majority of the Bible. Uh, so the Apocrypha, it, it's there are books in the Old Testament that were written during the intertestamental period. The intertestamental period is the period between testaments, right? <laughs> For all of you who don't understand English. So between the Old Testament and the New Testament is the intertestamental period. And that's where the Apocrypha fits. All those books were written in that time. Now, I'm just going to read you the, the names of the books. The books are as first and second Esedris, Tobit, Judith, Rest of Esther, Wisdom, Ecclesiasticus, not Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiasticus, uh, the Baruch, the Epistle of, and the Epistle of Jeremy, which is an important book. Song of Three Children, Story of Susanna, The Idol Bell and the Dragon, Prayer of Manassas, and First and Second Maccabees. That is the Apocrypha. So, the very important question, the question that I get all the time is, where did they come from? Right? Where, where did these books originate? And that's a good question. So, we, a long time ago, before Jesus was around, 
there was a time for that we needed to, the, the Jewish people wanted to translate the Old Testament from Hebrew into Greek. And so they got together 70 scholars, and those 70 scholars sat in a room, and they translated the Hebrew into the Greek, and they created a text called the Septuagint. The Septuagint. Now, besides just coming up with a really cool name for it, it, it focused, it was the, what the Jewish people considered scripture. This Jewish people considered scripture. So then, now we're going to fast forward a little bit. We're going to fast forward. Um, and we talked a little bit about this guy uh, last week. Pope Damasus, or Damasus, or Damasius, or I don't even know how to say his name, but a pope, right? In about the year 300 said, you know what we need to do? We need to create a Latin Bible. And so he got this guy. He was the foremost biblical scholar of his day. His name was Jeremy. I'm sorry. His name was Jerome. Close. He was almost Jeremy. <laughs> his name was Jerome, and Jerome was the guy when it came to the Bible. And so they, the Pope said, Jerome, I want you to get a Bible. I want you to get the collection together, and I want you to translate it all into Latin. And so Jerome set out to do that. And when he did that, he used the Septuagint as the Old Testament. Right? He used that collection of books that had been translated from the Hebrew into the Greek as the Old Testament. And he actually wrote that right there. That's it, actually. That picture, the, one, the big one at the very beginning, that was what's called the Latin Vulgate. The Latin Vulgate. And the Latin Vulgate was Jerome's creation. It was brilliant, it was beautiful, and it was used for centuries upon centuries as the authoritative word of God in the Roman Catholic Church. The Latin Vulgate. But at that time, the Old Testament was actually in flux. There had been, it would have been in a state of flux since the Septuagint. And from the time that the Septuagint was created until the time that Jerome created the Latin Vulgate, a lot of the books in the Septuagint, they had decided they were not scripture. And so, um, actually, even at the time of Jerome, the Septuagint was, had books in it that the Jewish people didn't consider scripture. But then, in 1500s, right, when we were creating the first English Bibles, the Protestants were, they looked at the Old Testament and they said, look, we're not going to use the Septuagint because what we're going to use is what the Hebrew people consider the scriptures. And so what the Jewish people consider the scriptures, that's going to be our Old Testament. And the difference between what in 1500 the Jewish people uh, considered to be the scriptures and what was in the Latin Vulgate was this amount, right? It was the Apocrypha. And so what happened was all these Bibles were printed, uh, were created and printed and made without the Apocrypha in it because they chose to use what the Jewish people uh, believed was Scripture as the Old Testament. So, there you have it. That's where it came from, right? Very simple. Um, and, and the reality is uh, that... The Catholic Church stuck to their guns, and that was what they considered the scripture, and they still do. Now, here's the critiques. Here's the critiques of what happened. So, this is a couple slides, and this is another, another pain. Here we go. Yeah, the Old Testament was finalized later. So, um, let's go. The critiques of it should be the next one down. Beautiful. First, there's no uh, direct quotations from the New Testament. No direct quotations from the New Testament. But there are some, like, allusions to it. Let me read you one. Uh, James chapter 1, verse 13. It says this. When you are tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. So that's what the book of James says. That's the New Testament. In the Apocrypha, there's a book called Sirach. Sirach 15. Verses 11 and 12 say, say, Do not say it was the Lord's doing that I fell away, for he does not do what he hates. Do not say 
It was he who led me astray, for he has no need of the sinful. And so though James doesn't directly quote the book of Sirach, he clearly summarizes one of the main teachings of that book. And that happens throughout the New Testament. There are several places where you could point to allusions between the New Testament and the Apocrypha, but no direct quotations. So there are some allusions. The second main critique of having the Apocrypha is that they're not currently in the Hebrew canon. They're not currently considered scripture by Jewish people, right? And so we believe that we are part of the line of God's grace that began with the Jewish people, and our Old Testament should be their Old Testament. And so one of the critiques is it's not in uh, the Hebrew canon. The next one, is, the next big critique is it has different doctrine, and we're going to get it more into that in just a second. And then, uh, and then it ended up being deleted. But really, the Catholic Church has reaffirmed over many years for Catholics that this is Scripture. This is useful for discerning the Word of God and hearing the Word of God in your life. Now, what does it say? Right? That's the really interesting thing. Because I bet a lot of you don't have a copy of the Catholic Bible at home, right? If you grew up in a Protestant church, you go to family bookstore, whatever, right? I, I, that's a ridiculous. You go to Amazon, right? And <laughs> and uh, and you buy a Bible, and it doesn't have the Apocrypha in it, right? They have, I don't even know how you get the Apocrypha Bibles on Amazon. I'm sure there's some way, but yeah, you have to search for it. So here's what it says. Here, it says some normal things. There's some, some passages in it that it could be from any part of the Bible, right? Uh, in the Book of Wisdom, it says, But you, O God, are kind and true, patient, and ruling all things in mercy. Really cool. I love that quote, by the way. Really interesting. Next one is from Manasseh. It says, For the sins I have committed are more in number than the sands of the sea. I have been in that place, right? I have been under the weight of my sin and felt exactly that. Then there's some odd things. There's a really great story about a dragon. Yeah, about a dragon in it. And, uh, and it says, in, in Bella and the Dragon, it says, Then Daniel took pitch, fat, and hair, and boiled them together, and made cakes, which... Uh, which he fed the dragon. The dragon ate them and burst open. Then Daniel said, See what you have been worshiping. Right? Really great story. Really interesting story uh, called Bell and the Dragon in the Apocrypha. So that's kind of weird. But you might say it's not any weirder than a fish coming out of the water and swallowing a guy and spitting him out three days later. Right? So, um, oh, and by the way, if you've ever wondered about talking donkeys, giant fish, and all that, we're going to be talking about that on October the 21st. Is that, did that really happen, right? That could be the, the subtitle for that. Um, next one, and, and here's the key, and here's the differences between the Protestants and the Catholic, is there's actually different doctrine. There's a, there's a book uh, called Second Maccabees, uh, and Maccabees are famous guys, and it's really interesting. Google Maccabees when you get home, and it's a really important thing for you to know if you want to understand why Jesus was uh, treated the way he was. Uh, but anyway, Maccabees, there's a great book, and they're in battle, right? They're trying to liberate the Jewish people. And uh, in 2 Maccabees, at the end, and I'm going to actually read a little bit more. I'm sorry, hey, I'm going to read a little bit more than it's on the screen. So uh, at some point, I'll start reading that. <laughs> sorry. All right, so uh, starting in verse 39 of 2 Maccabees, it says, On the next day, so they had a big battle, some guys died, right? That happens. And it says, On the next day, they, uh, as had now become necessary, Judas and his men went to take up the bodies of the fallen and to bring them back to life with their kindred in the sepulchres of their ancestors. Then, under the tunic of each one of the dead, they found sacred tokens of the idols of Jamnia, which the law forbids Jews to wear. And it became clear to all that this was the reason these men had fallen. So 
they all bless the ways of the Lord, the righteous judge who reveals the things that are hidden. So, summarize, because that was all in biblical speak, right? Guys died, they had little idol things, like rabbit splits, right, for luck, but it was like an idol of another god tied to their belt, right? And God says, sorry, you can't do that, right? And so they said, well, look, praise the Lord, these guys are idol worshippers, and he allowed them to be killed so that we would know that we had this idol worshipping problem, right? But they were their friends and their family, right? And so they didn't want, they didn't want eternal punishment for them. So it says, and continuing on, and they turned to supplication, praying that the sin that had been committed might be wholly blotted out. The noble Judas exhorted the people to keep themselves free from sin, for they had seen with their own eyes what had happened as a result of the sin of those who had fallen. He also took up a collection, man by man, to the amount of 2,000 drachmas of silver, and sent it to Jerusalem to provide for a sin offering, a sin offering for the sins of the people who were dead. To provide for a sin offering. In doing this, he acted very well and honorably, taking account of the resurrection. For if he were not expecting that those who had fallen would rise again, it would have been superfluous and foolish to pray for the dead. It would have been superfluous and foolish to pray for the dead. But, if he was looking to the splendid reward that is laid up for those who fall asleep in godliness, it was a holy and pious thought. Therefore, he made atonement for the dead, so that they might be delivered from their sin. There is a whole lot going on in that little passage. Idol worshippers die in battle. Judas, their leader, praises the Lord that he killed them, and then takes up a collection and uh, does the thing that, that God requires to cleanse the people who are dead of their sins. Then they pray for the dead people, for the dead people to be forgiven. All right? And so that is the key passage for the Catholic Church when they talk about purgatory, right? When they talk about the idea that you go into a holding place to maybe work out your sins, right? That is the key verse, the key passage, that they base their prayers for the dead and their services uh, for the dead on that in the afterlife, something can be done about the sins of people who died. And that's something different between the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church. And the reason that you've never heard that is because it's not in your copy of the Bible. It's in the books that were considered scripture by the Hebrew people a long time ago. And then by the time the Protestants were around, weren't considered scripture by the Hebrew people. So... Saints. Does anybody have any Catholic friends? Yes, right. And uh, I have Catholic friends, and this was my, the first time I got a really good Catholic friend. I was like grilling him, right? We had a car ride, and I was like, "So what about the saints? Why do you pray to those guys? Who are they? Hey, what about the Virgin Mary? What's up with that? Did you think she's Jesus' mom? But like." Seriously, she's not God. Like, and we went on and on, back and forth, right? We did all of that whole deal, and he was very gracious. And, and the reason I really felt I could ask him is because this guy was going to seminary. And, uh, and he was headed, well, not, he wasn't in seminary, he was headed that way. And, um, well, he, he ended up not going to seminary. <laughs> he got married, so, <laughs> see. Uh, so here's, here's what happens. Um, and, and, and here's something that's important to you. When you're doing research, if you want to get the official Catholic stance on things, there's lots of websites that have them. But you can tell if they're the official Catholic deal. Because at the very bottom of it, it'll have this little thing that says, this bishop in this place at this time says that this is free from doctrinal errors, right? 
And usually there's a second one that says this other bishop in this other place in this other time says that this is okay to print, right? So, I did some legwork for you guys to get the official Catholic stance on this so that you guys can hear exactly what it is that the Catholic Church believes. But before we do that, it's important for us to take a step back from this whole process. And the step back is to realize that there are significant differences in the way people worship. Very, diff very significant differences in the way people worship. And you can kind of boil it down into three ways that we view God. There's three kind of central views of God that, you know, you're going to kind of be biased towards one or the other, and that generally affects how you worship, like what it is you do in worship. So, uh, the, first way, the first view is that God is high. He is high above and lifted up. He is separated. He is the king on the throne, right? And that is absolutely true. Scripture is very clear about that. God is high above. He is lifted up. He is the king upon the throne. He is all of those things, right? Second view is that God is mysterious. God exists in a dimension that is very different than our own. He can interact with us, but God has no beginning and end of days. He can be in every place at one time and just in one place at one time. He can be personally there with me at the same time that he is personally there with everybody else. He is very mysterious. And then, God is our friend. The, the Psalms call him, that he, it says that he is a friend that sticks closer than a brother, right? All of these things are true about God. All of these things are true about God. Now, if you go to the Catholic Church, if you go down there um, to uh, Cathedral Square, if you go to the cathedral, and you, you go to their worship service, God is going to feel very high, right? He is going to feel very high. You're going to really get the sense that God is a king on a throne, that God is in power. If you go to an Orthodox church and you pay attention, you are going to really get the sense that God is mysterious. God is very different. God is very other. There are hidden things about God that we will never know. And if you come here on Sunday morning, you're going to come in and you're going to feel like you can converse with God just like your friend. You can sit down and tell God what's going on in your life. You're going to feel like God is a companion and he wants to be with you and walk beside you every step of the way. Right? Now, you've grown up in a tradition where it's the God is friend model, where we really make that clear. And you go into a place where God is high, you look at that and you say, this is not right. Right? You go in there and you say, it's so dry, it's so whatever, right? It's, there's not a lot of emotion or whatever it is that, that you kind of experience there. And, and you'll go into that place and it's our tendency, because we're creatures of habit, to have a preference for what we know. And you'll go in there and you say, well, this can't be genuine worship. It doesn't feel like the worship that I grew up with. But we have to realize that as much as God is our friend, God is mysterious. As much as God is our, um, as, as God is mysterious, God is our king. He is our ruler. And so all forms of worship, all those kind of forms of worship that are founded in the Bible and grounded in Scripture, and all those forms of worship are valid ways to worship God. And so what, what is important is that we understand, really, what, is it, what does it mean when somebody says they're a Christian? Right? And it's not a whole lot. There's a lot of things that we can disagree on and still be Christians. And I think the main one is that Jesus, Jesus is the only way to Father. Right? He is the only way to salvation. And if we can agree on that, 
we can agree on a couple of other things, that God, that God is three beings in one person, right? If we can agree, like, on, really, it's like ten things. If we can agree on those ten things, we can call ourselves Christians. So here's the deal. Like, when I say, okay, Jesus is the only way to the Father, now how do I accept that grace? Now, how do I accept that grace? That is different in different expressions of worship, right? How do I sign on and say, I want Jesus to be Lord of my life, right? How do I do that? That is different, depending on, is God my friend? Is God high above? Is God mysterious, right? So, who are the saints, right? The Catholic Church is very clear about the saints. That they do not make saints, they recognize saints, right? So the Catholic Church doesn't create saints. They recognize saints. And, and that's, that process starts uh, when a bishop, so somebody dies, and a bishop, somebody says, comes to their local bishop and says, hey, I think this person might be a saint. And they kind of go into their life and they make some reports, and it continues on. And, and really what they're trying to do is verify whether or not that person is in heaven. And so once they really feel feel good about the fact that this person is in heaven, then they allow people to begin in that local region to pray to that saint. And what they're looking for is they want, there's a second criteria. Are they in heaven? And second, do they have the ear of God? And so they allow people to pray to that saint, and, uh, and, and when they pray to the saint, if God answers those prayers, if there's a miracle as a result of praying to that saint, they go to like the next level. And after a couple of miracles happen, uh, then, then anyone can pray for them, can pray for them. So, here we are. Um, sorry. So, why well, pray to them? That's really the question, right? So, we understand who they are. They're just any, anybody, any random person who dies one of the holy life could become a saint, could be uh, recognized as a saint by the, by the Catholic Church. Um, and, and that means that they're in heaven and they have the ear of God. So, why would you pray to them? That's on a different slide. Why would you pray to them? Well, it has its roots in a very common practice. It has its roots in a very common practice, and that is this. Um, I've had a hard time in my life, and I go up to my friend Jim and say, Jim, I've got this stuff going on. Do you mind praying for me? Right? And Jim says, absolutely. I would love to pray for you. And so what they say is, it's the same thing. But instead of Jim being right here, Jim is already in heaven. Right? And so I'm, I'm saying to Jim, Jim, I know you're up there. Right? Could you pray for me? Because I'm going, I'm having a hard time down here. Right? And, and so it has some scriptural support. So let's look at that. It's in the book of Revelation. Ah, good, it's on the screen. Revelation chapter 5, verse 8. It says, And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders, 24 elders are humans, 24 elders, <laughs> fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. So there's human beings in heaven holding bowls full of incense, Bowls full of the prayers of God's people. Now, prayers aren't physical things, right? This is a metaphor. We can go with that, right? But what it means, so if you take that as metaphorical, in heaven there are people that are presenting the prayers of, of the people here on earth to God. And they're presenting the prayers of the people here on earth to God. So, you've got all these people in heaven. They're presenting the prayers of the people to God. The question that I asked my friend in the car after he gave me that very great response, I said, well, that's fine. But I mean, if I'm going to talk to somebody in heaven, and like, I can talk to Jesus. Right? Why don't I just go, go above their heads, right? Go straight to the real dude, right? And he said, yeah, absolutely. You, you, you should pray to Jesus. And, and that's on the Catholic Church official thing is absolutely. You should pray to Jesus. But the fact that we can pray to Jesus, if that eliminates the fact that we can have other people pray for us, 
for the importance of having other people pray for us. It eliminates the importance of having other people pray for us here on earth, right? And so it's the same thing. Like we go back to that original statement of, I can ask somebody here to pray for me. I can ask somebody there to pray for me. And it's the same thing. But they're in heaven and they're not, they're not alive anymore. Now, I'm not a Catholic. Right? I, I grew up I grew up in the Methodist Church uh, with a, a, a brief time as a prodigal son in the Episcopal Church, right? I, I, I'm not going to start praying the saints tomorrow, right? But I don't think it makes you not a Christian to have that belief, right? Revelation is a weird book, right? And, uh, and the other thing that I know is they've been praying the saints for a long time, right? At the very beginning, that first slide, you had the big Bible, but you also had St. Peter's. And there's lots of statues, right? But what gets confusing for us as Protestants is that we see people kneeling in front of a statue and we think they're worshiping the statue. But for them, they're recognizing that whoever the statue is of, that person is in heaven. And it's just the same as when we kneel with the Bible and we pray using the Bible. Like we pray with the Bible in our hand. We're not worshiping the Bible. Right? The Bible is something that's helping us worship God. Clear as mud? Yeah? Well, let's go on to the Virgin Mary. Let's get really complicated. <laughs> Virgin Mary. Uh, Virgin Mary. Oh, actually, if you see that, her, see the heart? Have you ever noticed that symbol in art? Right? Okay, that, that heart is actually called uh, the Immaculate Heart of Mary. The Immaculate Heart of Mary. And that is the first thing, the Immaculate Conception. And we believe in the virgin birth, right? That is actually one of those ten things that um, Christians believe, that you have to believe to be a Christian, uh, believing in the virgin birth. It's in the Nicene Creed, and that's, that's kind of our measure for what it means to be a Christian. Uh, but the Immaculate Conception is something wholly different than that. It's something uh, uh, one step further. So, as a... What they say is, if Mary were the sinful person, right, when she carried Jesus and then delivered Jesus, that Jesus would be born like we are all born, with original sin, right, with the stain from the Garden of Eden. And so, if that is the case, if a, a, a sinful person giving birth to Jesus would cause him to have original sin, then that person, if Jesus is to be without sin, Right? Jesus, to be a, live a sinless life, he can't have original sin. He's got to have none. None. Zero. And so what they say is when Mary was born, she was born with that state of original sin. But right after she was born, God reached down and cleansed her of that stain. She lived an almost sinless life. An immaculate life. Not a sinless life. An immaculate life. And so what that means is she had the state of original sin for a very brief time, and then from that point, the God comes her, from that point forward, she lived a sinless life. And that's important to them because that means that when she carried Jesus in her womb, and when she gave birth to Jesus, that she did not impart the stain of original sin on Jesus. And so Jesus couldn't actually live a sinless life. Mary lived an immaculate life. Jesus lived a sinless life. And the reason that he lived a sinless life was because of this idea of the immaculate conception. So, the, uh, the immaculate conception has its basis in, in Scripture as well. Um, and that's in Luke, the book of Luke. Matthew, Mark, Luke, chapter 1. Look at Luke chapter 1. I'm sorry, I didn't put that on the screen. Luke chapter 1. But I will tell you, this is a great place to bring a Bible to God. Luke chapter 1, verse 28, says this. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. And, and in the, if you read it in the original, it, the favored one is one that is full of grace. And the term full of grace uh, in the original language implies that the grace happened at one point before this moment, and that grace extended to this moment and then beyond. 
And so she had complete grace of God at some point, and extended from this point, that point, all the way on into the future. So they used that to say, look, this is where this doctrine comes from, right? So that is the idea of Mary of the Immaculate Conception. Again, that is as, that is as Catholic a doctrine as you can have, right? We believe that there are other ways that God could, uh, that a woman could carry Jesus, that Mary could carry Jesus, uh, bear, bear him, deliver him, and not have the state of original sin. But uh, we're not going to go into all of that because that's a whole other class, right? We're going to get through the rest of these. The last piece here is the assumption. So, in the Bible, you remember uh, when you were growing up, the flannel graph, right? And so you had the flannel graph and you had Elisha, right? And Elisha and Elisha are there. They're together. And you always confuse them because you're not really sure because there's like one letter difference, right? And so they've got the two flannel graphs like, this one's Elijah, this one's Elisha. And then Elijah prays for Elisha, and then all of a sudden the fiery chair comes down and Elijah rides up into heaven, which is way cool, right? As a matter of fact, I just decided that's what I'm, that's the bedtime story for my son tonight because that's awesome. All right, sorry. All right, going on. So uh, he gets in the chair and he rides up into heaven, which is really cool. That is, that is called assumption, right? Jesus has ascension. Only one, he goes, stands there, and he's like, all right, I'm out of here, guys. Peace out. And then of his own power, he goes, ah, up in heaven, right? That's Jesus' ascension. Assumption is God takes me, my body, my soul, my whole thing, into heaven by his power, right? So there's two guys in the uh, Old Testament, Enoch and Elijah. Some people argue it's possibly Moses right after he dies. But definitely Enoch and Elijah are assumed. And the Catholic Church adds to that list Mary. That Mary um, has uh, a moment of assumption. Uh, there's not a clear place in the scripture that refers to that directly. Um, there is a passage where it talks about, you, you probably read it, it's you know, like uh, right after Jesus and, and the, like the dead people rise out of the grave and there's this weird thing and you wonder if they're zombies or how that works or I don't know. But there's dead people, you know, who were dead, they're walking around, right? And, they, and so they, they kind of tie Mary's assumption into that, I don't know, it's a very loose tie. But they believe that she was assumed into heaven. And so... She has a special place among all humans for a lot of things, for a lot of reasons. A special place among all humans. First, she was assumed in heaven. Second, she lived the immaculate life. And third, and hello, she was the mother of Jesus, right? And so, I, you know, I love my mom, right? Uh, and though depending on which day you talk to her, she might have think that I've lived the perfect life. I haven't, right? But... I believe that mothers have a special place, and that Jesus' mother has an even special her place, because I love English, right? And, and so, the, so, so Mary has a special her place because she was Jesus' mother. Do I pray to Mary? I, no, I'm not Catholic, right? However, I don't fault them for any of that stuff, right? All that stuff is either not clear in Scripture or kind of there in scripture, and none of it denies any part of those basic tenets of the Christian faith. Not to mention, they believed that for hundreds of years before we were around. So, the question at the end of the day, so what? I believe firmly the core of who I am, that when God gives us knowledge, when God gives us understanding, that knowledge that God gives us demands something of us, right? It demands a response. And so what, is, what response does this knowledge demand of us? First of, first of all, and, and maybe most of all, I don't know, worship styles are just that, styles, right? Just like when I left New Song this morning, we went to Mexican food, right? Love Mexican food. Now, 
I know that some of the people that I know went to Morrison's, right? I'm not a fan of Morrison's. I don't like really, I don't like their, I don't like it's like, I don't think that it has any flavor. Probably because I burn out my taste buds of Mexican food all the time, right? But it doesn't mean that you can't go to Morrison's. It doesn't mean that you can't live off of Morrison's. It just means that some people like Morrison's and some people like Sabora Mexico. Next, the turf war needs to be over. Sometimes I feel like, as Protestants, we are still living in the 1500s in the thick of the Protestant Reformation. Right? I have met and I'm friends with people. It's as if they feel like they have to be Martin Luther in 2012, yelling at every Catholic they see and telling them why they are wrong on every single point of their very dearly held doctrine, right? And I don't know about you, but I'm tired of it. And I'm tired of it at, at this intense level. I believe, well, every, every time that we uh, take the body and blood of Christ uh, in the sanctuary, and, and even in here, we say some form of this prayer, this holy prayer. It says, make these elements be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world, the body of Christ, redeemed by His blood. By Your Spirit, make us one with Christ. I'm going to tell you, if there is ever going to be a hope for this broken, fallen world, it's going to take us working together. And, and if Catholics and Baptists and if all people ever see is us pointing fingers at each other and telling each other we're wrong, what kind of example is that? What kind of God do we serve? Is that is the most important thing to us. It's time for that to be over. So, that is, um, that's one of the things. And so as part of that, I think, Ignorance, ignorance can be a spiritual problem. Ignorance can be a spiritual problem. And so my heart is that before we accuse, we would listen. Before we would judge, we would spend time understanding. And then it would take a very long time and a whole lot of knowledge before we would say that somebody else is not a Christian. The time for the turf war is over. It's time that we get on with the work of Jesus in the world. And I believe that our brothers and sisters who worship God with censures and golden crosses and a common cup can do just as good of work as us who like to come in jeans and t-shirts. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you um, have allowed us to worship you in lots of different ways. We thank you that you're high, that you're mysterious, and that you are our friend. And so God, as we leave this place, as we leave this place, help us to be one with our brothers and sisters to appreciate their style of worship, even if it offends our palate, even if it's not what we want to do. May your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven as we join hands with all of those who worship you as their Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Next week is the God of Muhammad, the Father of Jesus. It's all about Islam, and you may have heard Islam tied in with uh, the Old Testament, Abraham and all of that, and so we're going to go deep into Islam and, uh, and its link to Christianity and what that has to say about how we live in our world. So we'll see you next week.